the minute I came in and I saw all the signs and I saw all the protests and I saw the graffiti, okay, I'm like, back. I'm home. <laughs> now everything is back. <laughs> Welcome back to SOAS, Kashav. Thank you. <laughs> it's Thank so you for having me. Yes, it's so good to see you. So you graduated from your LLM in 2007. Are you aging me? <laughs> Is it that kind of interview? <laughs> yes, it was in the Stone yes. Ages. Yes, I was. It was black and white. The world was in black and white. So do you remember these buildings at all? <laughs> <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> but yes, of course, the campus of SOAS is iconic. And uh, the minute I saw all the protests and the banners, yeah. I knew I was home. Yes. <laughs> yes, our students and staff have a really strong sense of political community and, yeah. uh, and feel free to voice their opinions, which is one of the things I love about SOAS as well. It's one of the reasons why I came. Yeah. I was going to ask you, so you studied at a few UK universities. So why did a you... A few universities. <laughs> Didn't you? Haven't you? Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Back in the Stone Ages, we only studied. <laughs> yes, I was, I was in University of Warwick first, uh -huh. where, is, where I did my law and business studies. Mm -hmm. Then I did a master's at King's College London. Mm -hmm. And then I did my LLM at SOAS. So what made you choose SOAS after having gone to Warwick and, and King's? Why I, I chose SOAS? Because of uh, A, I wanted to really do a master's in law. I, mm. I, there was something that I really wanted to do. And I think um, the faculty and, and basically their, their students and, and also their, the ideology behind SOAS. I think the whole, uh, the whole history sort of attracted me. Mm -hmm. to it what, what used to be a linguistic school for the colonies now was being run by the colonies mm -hmm. i was very attracted to that idea mm -hmm. and uh, and i wanted to see what it was for like for myself and for also just my own personal journey at that time that i was going through mm -hmm. so how did you use your LLM to then do all the things that you've done? You've been an activist, you've been a business entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you've uh, been an industry leader doing work around inclusion and, um, and integration into the economy of communities that are, are mm -hmm. marginalized. How have you been able to use your, your studies? The pleasure is all yours. <laughs> <laughs> you make me sound like as if I've done so much with my life, though. I, well, I, no. It's not true. Uh, I think I just did what was what I should, anybody should have done at least in the position. So first, let's check the fact that I I come from from India and I also come from a very privileged background, mm. which is not the same case for most of the country. And um, I think that it's it's about how you use your privilege. My glasses. Yeah. Should I take them off? Yeah. Are they reflecting? Yeah, sometimes there's a reflection. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Oh my god, now I, can, I can see everyone. No, <laughs> fine, I'll take this off. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I was saying that, uh, that it's, some, it's about how you use your privilege, right? Mm. And I think that uh, I really... Um, I had to check it. I had to check my, myself. Uh, at that time, it, back in India, we were... In particular, I'm going to now specifically talk about LGBTQ rights. Mm -hmm. um, the fight for uh, decriminalization mm -hmm. of Section 377, another gift of Queen Victoria and her morality, uh, was uh, started actually back in 2001. And uh, by the time I was finishing my degree here, the petitions had been filed in the uh, courts. Mm -hmm. um, and the case was up for hearing in uh, the Delhi High Court. And as you know, because I know we, you and I have discussed this before, mm -hmm. in 2009 was the first decriminalization of uh, Section 377 of homosexuality. And then, of course, it came back in 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came back in, because they went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court judges said, who are these uh, gay and lesbian people? They're too uh, minuscule a minority for us to care about. And so then came back 377. 
I of course finished my degree in 2007. Uh, however, when I went back, I um, at that time did not find any queer affirming spaces. There were no um, safe spaces for for queer folks. There were no bars, there were no nightclubs. There were no um, spaces that were actually even catering to the LGBTQ community or anybody that even spoke about LGBTQ inclusion other than what was going on in the courts. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were a few you know events that happened at and there were a few pride parades, no doubt. In Kolkata, pride parade started in 1999, but it was like one off. Uh, there was nothing that was happening on regular on a regular basis mm. and there was really no conversation it's a different world but there was no conversation of integrating uh, queer folks into workspaces into into legislature into courts into thing we, we were still considered in any case fringe uh, people and we were sort of completely put on the fringes of society mm -hmm. uh, 2009 was a landmark judgment however because it was 2009 there was no um, big hoo ha about it. There was no, mm. there was nothing really. There was no international presence. There was no social media. There was no um, viral moment. It was a very very important case, but it clearly did not get the attention. A few lines here and there, one or two headlines, and that's about it. Um, however, between two thousand and nine and twenty thirteen, there was a march towards further inclusion. When the Supreme Court brought it back and brought and reversed the decision of the High Court is when a lot of us privileged queers decided that we need to make sure that we're visible because we need to show that uh, queer people exist in India. They have existed for many, many, many centuries um, and, uh, and we needed to be visible. Mm -hmm. And so um, then even the lawyers that were on this, Menika Guruswami, Arundhati Kachu, Saurabh Kirpal, all of them also came out of the closet and, uh, and then basically went to a bunch of petitioners and said, are you willing to, to be visible? Because earlier the um, petitions was by Nas Foundation, which is brilliant, mm -hmm. but Nas Foundation was an NGO. And, uh, and the 20 petitioners that were a part of the NGO were hidden because a lot of them did not want to come out. So it was NAS Foundation versus Unif of India. That changed with the, the individual petitioners on that Navtej Singh Johar and, uh, and the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And then by 2018 was when the final decriminalization happened. Mm -hmm. It is at that time that I put to use whatever I learned at SOAS. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's how I guess I sort of subverted uh, the, the the system. And I think at that time also was a lot of time when I made sure that our company um, and the spaces that I was taking care of because of my privilege or because of the fact that I'm a Nepo baby as well. <laughs> uh, thanks, mom and dad. Uh, so... It, I decided that I'm going to basically make a safe space so that we can find our chosen family. Uh, I decided that I was going to queer every uh, every aspect of my organization, every every bit of the pitches that I made. And lo and behold, I'm here today. I don't know if that answered your question, and but I went on a journey. Yeah, it sounds like a yeah a very important journey. And yeah. congratulations for you know the the successes and thank you and also things that aren't necessarily um, that don't win in a don't end in a legal success yeah. are still very worth uh, having done. So I know the the marriage petitions, for example, and um, those types of things. But yeah. Um, but pushing forward, like you, you were starting to talk about with your company mm. and uh, having the employment practices that try to create a safe space or at least a space that's habitable yeah. by communities that are usually locked out of the employment market. Um, I've recently visited, as you know, the Lalit in, um, in Delhi and the mm. one in Mumbai, bringing people in who have um, disabilities. Yeah. Or LGBTQ, um, what challenges have you found in, in doing that? So I think the biggest challenge is for us to remember that we should not have a savior complex and that uh, what we're doing uh, is, is something that should have been. There have been many wrongs that have happened over the years of colonization and then in the years of, of just sort of subjugation and then little by little the court system, little by little the justice system, little by little companies 
have started correcting those wrongs. Mm. Um, when I discussed with you about the legal journey of of LGB, I did not mm-hmm. discuss the journey of the transgender community, mm. right? And the transgender community, however, in India has had a reverse story than the gays and lesbians. The trans community in India on paper has a lot of rights. As you know, on 2014 was the first time that the recognition of the third gender in India, um, where we recognized actually anything beyond the binaries of of the two genders. And it was one of the most trans progressive judgments that Mm. has ever been written. That judgment led to the Transgender Protection Bill in 2021 passed by the government. And I think India is one of the very few countries that has that. Now on paper, the trans community, because they were completely removed from society, Mm. they were given no choice but to do sex work or begging. Um, A lot of years of of sort of uh, being completely ostracized on paper, they ended up getting all of these rights, but it did not actualize into full-time inclusion, right? And so that took a long time. And I think that's the first thing that we did actually was that we made sure that we worked with the trans community. Now within the trans community, there is the Hijra, Kinnar, and then there is the modern day trans and worked exactly with them, understanding what they would like, how they would like to, to work with us and how we have to change the perception Mm. of what is considered a luxury hotel. Mm. Um, And suddenly you will have from everywhere, from the right from the beginning to the person who checks you in to a general manager level, a trans person. So I've got to say that I'm very proud of the fact that we are that trans inclusive. The same logic that we used for ourselves in the entire spectrum of LGBTQI+, is exactly what we did with people with disabilities Mm -hmm. and uh, acid attack warriors. Now you can't paint diversity and inclusion under one brush. You Mm -hmm. have to work with the intersections of each of the communities you want to represent and there's no right or wrong way to do it. But I can sure as hell try, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, and I think that was the reason behind uh, why we did that. But I think the biggest challenge now is to make sure that the communities that we're representing are actually sitting in positions of power in the company. So how long are you going to marginalize the marginalized because you want to save a community and therefore you keep marginalizing a particular community? How, how are we going to change systems? How are we going to be able to stay in, to actually have structural changes within the organization's thinking, mm-hmm. but also structural changes in the organization in terms of even inclusion. If you want people with on a wheelchair or if you want people with disabilities to come to your hotels, work with you, then are you infrastructurally even ready for that? Mm-hmm. And I think, um, I think right now the point, point is to if, how do we make sure that the, the minds are so empowered that it is not about us anymore. Mm -hmm. It's about really serving a larger community. And it sounds so strange for a person like me to say that, who's sitting in a position of privilege, who's sitting uh, selling luxury hotels, and then faffing about all of this. Mm -hmm. But that's just how my brain works. And that's how this company Mm -hmm. works. And somehow we're managing to to live together. But yes, I think the biggest challenge right now is to make sure that everybody is represented, but at all levels Mm -hmm. to stop looking at diversity and inclusion and just putting everybody at only entry level positions Mm -hmm. and not having them in in on your board, not having them on as as general managers and people that are actually taking decisions because listen, we can pretend to walk in everybody's shoes, but we know that we're not right. But we can try, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like meaningful inclusion as opposed to um, just inclusion for the sake of, you know, uh, rainbow washing right, or exactly. pink washing or yeah. being, uh, you know, on a ranking. Mm-hmm. I guess it has to be in your DNA. Otherwise, mm-hmm. there's really no point of doing it or you're doing it for the sake of doing it, which, sure, I'm not 
calling out any other company or I'm not calling out uh, how others work but but yeah but modeling that for other companies to see what meaningful inclusion looks like I think is is a really great start thank you I want to also ask you since we are um thinking in this setting about about your your story what is one thing you would have told uh the Keshav who was starting their LLM in 2007 um Hmm. about you know your future that you wish you could have heard then whoa i'm not really well <laughs> if this is a question from rupaul's drag race and if mama ru was sitting in front of me and said here is a picture of <laughs> <laughs> the young if you would have done it in that way then i would have been like mama <laughs> <laughs> whatever you say mama and then i would have started crying and been like I would have said to myself, you must do drag and there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> what would I say to myself in 2006 when I was here? Mm. Um, I would say, uh, make sure that you challenge the system, whatever mm. system that may be. Mm. And, uh, and I did, so it's fine. But it took me a while to get there. Mm. And I think I would say to myself, uh, don't marry the first Frenchman you see in your life. Uh, you know, try other European <laughs> nations. Uh, yeah, that he, no, but I'm so lucky to have ha ha found him and actually married him. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I would say whatever I, I would have thought that I would have achieved in 2006, I think I've done much more than that. Mm. So I mm. really, you know, I, I think I was a very different person back then. I, I, was, I was also, you know, dealing with the loss of my father and I was, uh, so I think maybe I will tell myself to be resilient uh, and, and to have resilience and to just basically uh, be, be clearly fabulous. And because you know that you are in a position of privilege you know that you can uh, you 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 can do it. Then do it. Hmm. Apologize for it later, but do it. Hmm. Yeah. Keshav, thank you very much for indulging us with this interview. You're most welcome. And come back anytime. Sure. <laughs> Call me. <laughs>